you to Crest uh, and to you, Mick, for uh, inviting me to to open up the uh, the seminar series for this uh, for this uh, academic year. Uh, a, a warm welcome to to everyone uh, to Rohampton, although uh, from a distance, under the the circumstances that we are all experiencing. Uh, welcome to the psychology department and to to Crest, the Center for Research in Social and Psychological Transformation. I myself joined in in March this year, about seven months ago. And uh, although, again, from a distance and in in, 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 uh, during a lockdown, I very quickly found my expectations uh, for the department already very positive to be, to exceeding what I, what I was expecting, uh, a, a team of excellent colleagues uh, who have their students in, uh, and, and their work in their hearts, a department with values uh, such as social justice, inclusion, community engagement, uh, active participation and citizenship, and a vibrant, diverse student body with so many experiences and, and, and so much the, to give uh, to the community when they leave us and while they are with us, actually. Um, here at Roehampton, we, we are a, a, a hub of, of, uh, of a number of talking therapists, training in, in talking therapies from our um, counseling psychology professional doctorates to our counseling and psychotherapy programs with adults and children as well. Uh, all five arts and play therapies uh, programs, which I'm told might make us unique in the world, actually. Uh, and of course, bespoke programs like the MSc Attachment Studies, uh, the program convener of which we have the honor to be uh, listening today. Um, as you probably know, a, a department that, that uh, showcases an excellent research portfolio and very active research centers and Crest being one of the, of the best examples. Uh, Crest is specializing in psychotherapy and counseling. Uh, it's uh, harvesting the experience and all the, the, the amazing work that is being done in the field, in the department, and of course, is running its own clinic. Uh, it's also particularly unique that uh, uh, in their mission to understand and explore the interface between individual transformation and social and political change which I think is, 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 so, is so important and, and so relevant and so much in, in connection with the Roehampton values. Uh, and they've been running the seminar series for now six years, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Mick, from since January 2015. And although up until now there was a, a, a pub session after the, the, the seminar talks, now we have to do it online and, and let's hope that soon we will all be together again. Um, and me joining you uh, since uh, I, I've been here only seven months. Um, I'm delighted that I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be opening the, the seminar series. I, I'm sure you will find it stimulating. I hope you will join us as, as many in as many as, as you can. Uh, I certainly look forward uh, to, to, to them and I, I, uh, I wish everyone a happy and stimulating uh, a year. So welcome again. Thank you so much, Yanis. It's lovely to have you here as our head of department. So just to um, say a few words about Ben. So Ben uh, is a senior lecturer and director of the Attachment Studies Programme here at the uh, Department of Psychology at the University of Roehampton. And the programme that we have, the Attachment Programme, is really a unique opportunity to apply the insights of attachment theory that I know so many people are interested in to clinical practice and research settings and also to learn validated procedures that offer insights into the effects of trauma uh, and adversity on children's, children and adults. The course is designed for um, psychologists, counselors, social workers, therapists, and any professionals looking to deepen their understanding of human relationships, as well as psychology graduates in this area. So Ben, in particular, the research that Ben has done is developing something called the meaning of the child interview, which is a method of assessing parent-child relationships through the way that the parent talks about the child. And the tools particularly aimed at differentiating between uh, different struggling relationships in ways that might support intervention. Ben's also a social worker with a long experience of use of uh, attachment patterns in a family court setting. And we looked after children and with adopted parents. And Ben's also uh, the father of a young adult who has an autism diagnosis, so that he's got personal experience in this area as well. So, Ben, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, I'll let you know when we have five minutes or so before questions. But thank you so much for coming along and being here. And we're all, I think, looking forward very much to hearing what you say. Thank you very much.
Okay, I hope people can see that now. Um, the title of the talk, Feeling Like You're on a Prison Ship, Understanding the Caregiving and Attachment Narratives of Parents of Autistic Children. So I must admit, when I started reading some of the social media around this event, it's, um, it was somewhat daunting because I'm quite aware, and I think I have to say this at the outset, that likely in this audience we have people who are, like me, parents of children with an autistic diagnosis, and possibly people also with that diagnosis themselves. So I'm quite aware that this is a um, personal issue. So, and added to that, the um, attachment and autism has a kind of history, or at least um, the idea of looking at autism relationally has a kind of checkered history. And in particular, the stereotypes that emerged quite early on of the refrigerator mother and um, comparisons like Bruno Bettelheim's work, which compared parents of autistic children to concentration camp guards. So I was quite aware when, when kind of reading about this, this, there may be a lot of fear among people, particularly who have a personal interest in this as to what this talk is going to be. Um, so just to give the, uh, a bit of context, this is a study that has emerged out of a therapy program um, for families of children who have an autistic diagnosis. It's called SAFE, Systemic Autism Related Family Enabling. Um, so the context of this is to try and find non-blaming ways of working relationally with families where a child has a diagnosis. And I guess um, I'm gonna develop this as I go along, but the way out of the kind of di dilemma um, that, that we have of trying to think um, of kind of attachment theory, which looks at sees problems in relationships and the fear of blame that parents with autism have, um, parents of children with autism have is I think twofold. One is to look at problems as residing in family and social systems, not in either individual parents or autistic children. And the other, I think, and I owe this to the work of Rudy Dallos, um, is to look at the difference between intentions, um, blame and responsibility. And I'm gonna develop this as we go along. But in essence, as parents, we can be responsible for the ways in which we influence our children without being to blame for the fact that things don't work out as we may have attended. So I just hold that thought and we'll come back to it later on. So just to set some context, um, the DSM defines autistic spectrum disorder as an impairment of social interaction, social communication, and involving repetitive and restrictive interests. I think the key point here is that this is a the, this um, is a social definition. In other words, all of this um, can't really be restricted to one individual. It, it's defined by um, you know there's someone else involved, if you like, in the definition of autism itself. Even the latter one, repetitive and restrictive interests, what defines those is what they mean within a social context. So, for example, somebody. Um, you know, learning to be an expert pianist would have to put thousands of hours into what might be seen as repetitive and restrictive um, kind of practices in order to gain that expertise. So what's defined as that has a kind of social context and a social meaning. Um, an example of this that came out of the study was um, one parent was kind of almost shocked at, the, at her child who um, had taught himself Spanish. Now I come from the area of Cambridge, which is a bit of an um, education hothouse. And a child who'd learned another language is almost, kind of, well, if not expected, is kind of part of the, um, you know, part of the social media. So that, so the, what can be seen as an obsessive interest is itself a social definition. Now the popular conception of autism is that it is a genetic disorder. But the picture around it from the research is a little bit more, um, it, it is more ambiguous. Um, the 
Inheritability studies suggest that genes account for about 50% of the risk of developing autism, but the researchers have found no autism gene or even a common genetic profile linking all the families. Um, the best, I think, with a recent study found a common profile linking about 10% of the families, but the genes they found were associated with cognitive impairment rather than the symptoms of autism. And they're also found in the unaffected group. And of course, in finding just 10%, it leads, it begs the question, well, what about the other 90%? So I guess out of this, given that autism is something, if you like, is a phenomenon without a causal explanation, perhaps we should be looking at what explanations can we find for the family problems that families who have children with this diagnosis have, rather than searching necessarily for a generic cause of autism. So what happens when we turn to the research about these families? Well, the, the, um, the picture is not a positive one by and large. The research refers to high levels of stress and anxiety in parents of children who have autism, unpredictability and, unpredictability and uncertainty, guilt, blame and social stigma, social isolation. Of course, it's not all bad and the research attends to the resilience that parents find and the new ways of coping. But however, there's a kind of worrying underbelly, um, high levels of physical and sexual abuse, higher than would found in what you might call the typical population. So the key I think to all of this is that these are relational difficulties. And the research around this is interesting, that um, when you start to look at the parents of autistic children, um, emotional mental health disorders frequently predate the arrival of the autistic child. Many parents have earlier experiences of trauma and abuse. Um, and of course, what attachment theory would suggest is that trauma and mental health difficulties would themselves impact on the parent-child relationship. And as I've just been saying all along, the autism diagnosis itself is relational. So it's only possible through assessing relationships rather than simply individual pathology. So why is attachment relevant? Well, attachment theory provides a model for understanding how human beings survive danger, form protective relationships and promote the survival of their children. The attachment of the infant to the caregiver is where our innate genetic qualities, both those that are universal to our species and those unique to each individual, meet experience. Biology and experience meet in the infant caregiver relationship. Put another way, the attachment shapes the early development of the human brain. So it's interesting, um, in the case of autism, where certainly there may well be a genetic loading, that attachment then is where is kind of shapes where what we bring from our genetics kind of meets where the rubber hits the road so far as experience is concerned. So what does the attachment research and autism say? Well, it's an interesting picture and a confusing one. Autistic children show the full range of attachment patterns. They have slightly lower levels of securely attached children than um, typical populations, about 45 to 53%, whereas about 55 or so would be expected in a typical population. Um, but at another level, this doesn't really make sense. If the previous research that I was mentioning about how stressed the parents and families are, are so, then how does, it, how does it happen that the children are more or less almost as secure as typical, um, as typical children? The whole point of attachment theory is that children should be developing a strategy, a pattern um, related to their environment. And if their environment is a stressed one, then they ought to be distressed, um, they ought to be developing a pattern of attachment that reflects that stressed environment. One of the problems is, is that, um, well, there's a number of problems here. The first is that attachment, words like security and insecurity are unhelpful because they already suggest a moral um, judgment around what's good and what's bad. We all want to be secure and we all don't want to be judged insecure. 
Whereas the attachment research suggests that the patterns of attachment that attract these labels of security and insecurity are, are responses to the environment. So essentially someone using a pattern of attachment that would be labeled secure in an environment that is, um, <clears throat> That is, that, that is difficult or adverse would actually be using a pattern that is unhelpful. So if you like, security is the label we give to the attachment pattern that, it, that um, most suits safety. But of course, safety in, in, um, is not characterized by many, you know, many of us, let alone the families of autistic children. The other big issue is this overlap of symptoms between all the kinds of attachment insecurity and the definition of autism. So how do we distinguish what the two of them are? There have been attempts in the research to clarify the two, but it begs the question whether the autism symptoms themselves have an interpersonal function. So is it artificial to say this is autism and this is attachment? when some of the symptoms of autism may themselves have a relational, um, have a, a, a relational reason, even, even if that relation, that, that reason, if you like, is to withdraw um, because they find the parents' um, attempts to communicate overwhelming. So what's what, what, what about the research from an attachment point of view into caregiving? Well, one of the, an early influential study suggested um, that autism, um, as I've, I've really been saying, it challenges the, the very tenet of attachment theory. There was one um, study that found less attachment security in autistic children, but that had no relation to the parents' sensitivity. But again, part of the problem has been the attempt to quantify things like sensitivity. When what's critical is not just that parents are responsive to children's signals, but in the nature of that response and what that response is actually trying to achieve. So in essence, they found that lower parent-child relatedness, limit setting and parental engagement um, is the case in many parents of all um, ASD children. And also that the sensitivity of parents um, predicts the development of ASD children's communication. This is quite an interesting study because it's a long, 16 year old, 16 year, year longitudinal one. The, um, so by and large, following that, the, the study that I mentioned before, when, when um, researchers have sort of honed what sensitivity actually is, there's, there's been a strong vein of research that has suggested that how parents parent their children actually affects what might be called the symptoms of autism, empathy, communication, social skills, and so on. I think this is much clearer when you look at the, the procedures that tap in to how parents think about their children. Um, sorry. So there's been, um, Studies that suggest the insightfulness of parents relating to their ASD child um, is, um, is related in if essentially to the child attachment, child engagement, and the ability of the child to manage inclusive education up to nine years later. Similarly, attachment security in the mother's adult attachment interview, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later, is related to the child's relational and functional behavior. And finally, Parents' corrective intentions to parent better than their own traumatic or adverse childhoods often were derailed by unconscious aspects of their past experience. And this is gonna be a key issue that we'll hone into as I develop. So where do we go with all of this? Well, there's some big problems with the methods of how attachment has studied the problem, uh, studied autism. The first is, they've adapted the procedures for autistic children with, for example, in the strange situation procedure, which is a way of assessing the attachment of children, um, well, usually between about one and two. Um, they've used shorter separations and 
use the procedure with older children than would normally be um, normally be allowed, as it were. Now, the problem with this is attachment is not a quantitative construct. By that I mean attachment attachment does not predict that children with a particular pattern will behave precisely the same um, in, um, in, for example, in a strange situation laboratory setting as they might do at home. What it is arguing is that there is an underlying organisation to children's behaviour, that it functions in a certain way in order to ensure safety in the relationship. So modifying the procedure in that way begs the question um, for autism, begs the question of whether the results that come out of these studies are truly comparable. In addition, in addition, as I've already suggested, there's a problem of quantification. In other words, trying to judge the amount of sensitivity or the amount of security um, in relation to attachment when um, what we're actually judging is what is the function of some of these behaviors. So there's a great mixture in the studies as how they've assessed these constructs, which again makes comparisons difficult. In addition, there are cultural differences around what autism means, around what attachment means, and this has proved problematic in the research. And then finally, the field of autism itself, and this isn't just related to attachment, um, but there's a difficulty with widening definitions of autism and other problems associated with attachment, uh, sorry, with autism and kind of separating the two out. And finally, that there's very little attention to the wider social system, in other words, most of the research deals with mothers. There's very little attention to fathers or the wider social system in which the child um, is situated. Okay. So what do I take out of all of this? Well, what I think the principles behind this study is what I would call a formulation approach to researching autism. Autism is not a causal explanation. It's a phenomenon that might be explored through attachment procedures and indeed other research. And I think this separation between autism and attachment by and large is artificial. And so the research that has just tried to kind of assume that we know what autism means and we know what attachment means, as I think has begged the question, we need to understand what the relationship actually is. And we need to explore whether in fact, what might be called the symptoms of autism actually have a relational fact function or not rather than simply exclude the two um, in our analysis. Finally, to, to recognise that almost autism exists within a family and a wider social system, so it's not just an individual problem. So as I've said earlier, rather than trying to find the cause of autism or make these kind of... Um, it, we're at too early a stage, I think, for the quantitative research that's been done to, um, which tends to go on the assumption that we actually know what we mean by these two constructs. We actually need to actually burrow down to the problems of living experienced by these families where there's autism and see if we can understand them a little better. So what I'm arguing for is ideographic case-based research to tease out this complexity and theorize about the differences. A more qualitative analysis rather than quantitative analysis, which has its value but rather presumes, as I've already been arguing, that the constructs are well-defined. A relational approach that looks at how parents think about their children, how parents um, respond to them, and also the impact of trauma. And then also a formulation that explores the meaning of behavior in specific relationships, rather than simply tries to quantify particular behaviors. And as I've said, developing a systemic understanding of autism that places child and parent in a family and social context. Okay, now I need to motor on. Um, research questions are deliberately broad. Um, we're looking at how parents of autistic um, children make sense of their child and how might this impact on the parent-child relationship? What role, if any, does past trauma play? And does the parental understanding of autism itself impact on caregiving? The sample is part of a wider um, study of the SAFE intervention, 
um, although all the work was done prior to intervention. So it simply took 16 parents of type two, one and two autism, which is the less severe diagnosis. They'd all been diagnosed within a year. The children were aged between five and 15. There were fathers and mothers, and this was a UK sample. What we've been an analyzing here are parent development interviews, a semi-structured interview that assesses parental representations of caregiving expanded to ensure a shortened adult attachment interview, which looks at how the parent thinks about their own past and their own experiences um, of early care. Added to this were autism related questions, including uh, questions about the sibling without autism if they were present in the family. Evidently it's had ethics permission um, and is part of a wider study. But I need to emphasize here that names, ages and genders and other details have been altered in the presentation that follows in order to protect um, identity. So whilst the issues, dilemmas and discourse patterns and the pain of these families are all very real, any relation to specific families or people is unintended. In terms of the methodology, um, the analysis was of the attachment discourse using the meaning of the child interview and the adult attachment into you both assess what we would call self-protective transformations of meaning in an interview transcript. The adult attachment interview looks at past trauma and the strategy of self-protection. The meaning of the child looks at caregiving and reproduction. It looks at the child is in a sense as the parent's strategy of long-term survival. Out, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the, this discourse analysis as it's not well known. But out of this um, comes an individual case formulation. How can we best understand the parent-child relationship um, and the relationship between the parents' um, history, if you like, and their caregiving? And then out of each individual case, we built up um, an analysis, if you like, of the, um, the sample as a whole by essentially um, abstracting and theory building out of the individual case formulations. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about the method of um, analysis as it's not so well known. Perhaps one of the neglected areas within qualitative analysis is the interpersonal. So to, to, to quote two quotes from the literature, um, the qu a qualitative literature around um, autism. One study, an IPA study, said, quoted a mother as saying, I give birth to hope and I have found disappointment. Another study quoted a parent as saying, I had a difficult child and was perceived as a bad mother. If only I had known all along that I was not the cause of all this. So the question that this raises from an attachment point of view is if the parent holds this understanding of the child, what is the impact of the child? So whilst the, um, the first The Oprah and Stan study quite rightly was giving voice to the experience of the parent and what happened, if you like, when they came to terms with um, their child's condition, What's interesting, I guess, and unexplored by the, by the method is of course, what does it mean to grow up as, a disappoint, as embodying your parents' disappointment? And in the second study, it drew attention to the social narratives around bad being, you know, being a bad mother, being a good mother and so on. And the way, you know, the, the shame and the social stigma that mothers, especially mothers of um, children with autism had Again, whilst the diagnosis released this mother from blame, what does it mean for the child essentially to be seen as the cause of all the parents' stress and difficulty? So to give an example of how this works, I'm just quoting one incident. We had that little moment together, you know? I love taking him out in the buggy. And how did you feel this morning when that happened? I just love him, you know. I actually said to, to his sibling, I was looking at his massive fat legs and I said, he's just got the, like, the cutest, fattest legs ever. 
And I said, I want another one. I want it all over again. And she's like, you want to do that again? And I said, I would do it again in a heartbeat if I could. And that sounds crazy because it's been so hard, you know, so many difficult times. Even his birth was like horrendous. But I would if I could. I could have another one. If I could another one of him, I could because he's such a joy in so many parts of it. You know, in my life, he brings so much joy. So what we get out of this is that Jenny is trying to illustrate the depth of her connection to a child of autism. Her language also reveals the more painful emotions that she seeks to distance from. Her, the annotations in the, um, in the analysis would track self-protective shifts in meaning. And as I'm gonna show in a moment, she holds multiple and competing representations of her child, which can be seen in her very positive generalized semantic statements, but the, the feelings that come out in the nature of her language and the image she employs. So if you like, and I hasten to add, the importance is not in isolated fra phrases, but the observation of patterns across the narrative as a whole. So to sort of break this down, we could look at the words like little moment, where the use of cliched language robs the statement of emotional force. And then the image massive fat legs, which is a kind of image of disgust that has an objectifying quality cutest fat legs ever, it seems to be an attempt to row back, but also has an objective quali um, quality, as does, I want another one, I want it. Um, so even as the mother is attempting to express an intensity of connection, the kind of language still has a distancing quality. Mum uses the sibling's voice to sort of prove the lengths that she would go. I want to do that again. I want to do, do it in a heartbeat. But then you get very evocative language around how difficult things have been. Crazy, hard, difficult times, horrendous. The powerful affect contain is contained in how bad things have been. The use of the word even suggests that even much of the rest of the parenting is horrendous, implying that the difficult birth was a high point. And then of course, I could have another one of, one of him and he's a joy in so many parts of it, uses quite awkward in distancing language. But again, mum tries to kind of go back to the joy um, to sort of emphasize the intensity. So what I'm trying to draw out of this is the kind, um, the different representations of the child apparent in the language and the analysis breaks it up and relates it to mum's need to protect from the pain, um, to protect herself from the pain um, involved in parenting her child. So what did we find? The parents carried a high level of attachment related trauma from which they'd largely been uncomforted and unprotected. This shaped how they experienced and cared for their children in unique and powerful ways, often undermining their explicit attempts to offer their child something better. Many parents experienced a chronic lack of agency in relation to their parenting. This can be related to the discourse of autism as separate and other, as well as uh, an innate and unalterable problem, which challenges the very caregiving system itself. To put this in context, almost all the parents reported developmentally inappropriate dangers in their early life from which they were neither protected nor comforted. All these particular parents, and I haven't forgotten the other two, I'll come back to them later, showed evidence of either unresolved trauma or non-normative strategies of attachment um, organized around serious danger. This is not, uh, this is in a way what we expected, um, but I think what this study has been able to look at is the ways in which the danger shaped the context in how the child was perceived and experienced. And all the relationships were seen through the analysis as struggling in different ways, ways that might make more sense in the light of past experience. So just to put this in context um, of the kind of existing theoretical models before I start looking at the results in more detail. This is a rather simplification of Mackenzie and Dallasor's formulation. And what they're trying to show in this 
is how a kind of circular mo model of how attachment insecurity can itself impact on what may be called the symptoms of autism. So the, the um, escalating family tensions as a result or, or in response to the behavior is responded to or triggers attachment insecurity in the parent and other family members, their sense of exhaustion, shame and, and, and helplessness, which then has a further impact on the child and so on. What I quite like about the circular model is this isn't about blaming either the child or the parent, or indeed it isn't about saying that the, the insecurity causes the autistic symptoms in the child, but rather saying and looking at, at how problems are maintained, if you like, um, in what the family therapists call problem saturated systems. In other words, where they are their entrenched problems, we're seeing how, um, how they get held up and maintained, regardless of how they arose in the first place. Now this study is focusing simply on the dyad rather than the family system. I introduced the, the slide earlier to show that we look at this within a wider system, not just, um, not just the parents, but I'm kind of honing in, if you like, on the parent and the child. So again, we could see how the experience of parenting a child, particularly in these sort of problem saturated interviews, um, is one of rupture. And the pain of rupture takes on a self-protective meaning from the parent to the parent from the past. Out of that parent, that in order to protect themselves from the pain, the parent may reject the child, merge themselves in some way or withdraw in order to keep functioning as a parent. But this of course results in further shame and hurt for both parent and child, which then the child responds to and so on. Now I wanted to add this because there's a danger here. Um, attachment theory can sometimes seem rather mechanistic and it can ignore the way in which parents are actually struggling to do things differently. So what this is, is a way of looking at how the child's request, if you like, the child's attachment signal, a request that says something like, I need support, or this is overwhelming, is responded to by the parent, both with their script, if you like, that comes from their trauma, the way in which they protected themselves from past trauma, but also their intention to do something different, to offer a better life to their child than they had. Now, of course, the difficulty of, um, of that, that is that we, we can change our behavior, but it's much harder to change how you feel. So the child is picking up, not just on how the parent sort of is, is what the parent is doing, but how they are also feeling. And the gap between the two can cause problems. And then of course, the difficulty is, is when there, there are ruptures in the relationship, the parent feels intense shame at not doing, if you like, what they promised in itself. And that shame elicits further defensive caregiving. And out of the rupture that, are, um, that emerges, the child themselves, the child themselves has a, um, um, the, child's, um, the child struggles, and of course, makes more attachment requests, so continuing the circle. Okay. I want to look at some now, um, some examples of this. First to look at the way in which parental trauma can influence the way the child is parented and, and, and perceived. So this is Claire. Claire for whom separation and abandonment were key in her um, early life. Still to this day, I've never met my biological father. He just didn't want anything to do with me. Did you ever feel rejected, frightened or hurt physically, emotionally by your parents as a young child? Me and my mum have had this conversation quite often because not finding out that the man who I thought was my dad wasn't my dad and not finding out until the age of 10, I think has really affected me. And then you can see it spilling over into our actual experience. 
Well, I was young. I don't know where they'd gone. I really don't. I think I was left like with my aunt and uncle. I don't really remember now. I literally felt abandoned. I don't think it was even for that long. But at that time when you're young, it was just, I did, I just thought they'd gone. And it felt like a lifetime, but I don't think it was. So we can see how that influence from the past spills into mum's fear of abandonment, um, both from her partner and her children. The children's father is an overseas charity worker and is often away for long periods. Mum has heard he's not returning when expected. Julie is the child with autism. They've, to be honest, they've got to the point where they're like, oh, mum's crying again, because it's happened quite a lot. But, you know, at first, obviously, I had to tell them dad wasn't coming home. So there was like just Simon, Julie, Kitty, Indy and me. And Kitty and Indy started crying and I cried with them. Julie just sat there in silence. And then three hours later, she burst out crying. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I was just like, what's wrong? I thought something had happened again. But she just said, dad, not coming home. And so that made me cry again. So, you know, we're the sort of family, I'm not afraid to cry in them in front of them. You know, I'd rather us all cry together and had hugs and things like that and just kind of deal with Julie, you know. I suspect really I have to start all over again. So Claire struggles with anxiety and depression. She wants to create the kind of family where people are open with each other and don't have the secrets that characterised her own past. But the difficulty is that is she's kind of overcompensating and the children are caught up in her distress at her partner's absence. Julie's experience is other for not sharing the distress. Note the power of the image. Julie sat there in silence. And Julie's delayed distress is seen as the source of mum's further distress. Made me cry and the source of her re-traumatisation. I have to start all over again. So I'm not saying that mum's difficulty are causing Julie's problems, but we can see how mums need to create um, a different sort of family is creating the context in which Julie's behaviour is experienced. To look at another pattern, Linda man had to manage an, a volatile alcoholic mother and early experiences of chronic neglect. And she managed so by keeping a tight lid on her difficult feelings, managing her needs independently, because Linda doesn't want to inflict her moods on her children, but in doing so, in protecting her children, if you like, from her difficult feelings as a way that Ju Linda's mother didn't, she's disconnecting from them. Linda manages the relationship through separation. So her autistic son says to her, you're so used to a traumatic life that when traumatic things happen to you, you don't react properly, mum. And I'm like, I do, I'm just used to it. And then he actually said, you're making me feel really, really bad because you're not even angry. You're just crying about your journal. But I wasn't, I couldn't be angry. I was more sad. I was just disappointed and sad. So I think that was the odd thing for him because he used to being told off to used to me getting do this, blah, blah, blah. This was following an incident where he destroyed a precious mum's precious diary. So listening to Linda talk about autism, it causes stress, but I think we get on really well and I don't overly notice or care because I'm used to it. And so I'm aware that it affects the other people, other people notice, but I'm aware it affects his life and school and friend and life and things like that. But within our family, it's, there's no, it's not different. It doesn't matter. And then on conflict with her son, I don't mind it. It's emotional, it's normal. It's normal to get angry. I think he deals with it well. We all get angry, we all have bad times. It's good that he expresses it. So notice how the distancing language, the it's, the I don't notice, it doesn't matter, helps Linda deal with the feelings related to the conflict. 
But when she describes that conflict, she and her son are very separate. It's emotional, it's normal, it's normal to get angry. He deals with it well. We all have bad times. It's good that he expresses it. So she doesn't describe an interpersonal process where she's involved with helping her son um, regulate his feelings. So in trying to protect her son from her own feelings, the cost of this is a certain disconnection from her son's experience. Moving on to, um, <clears throat> to another pattern, and I will try and deal with some questions later. Um, Carol deals with things a little differently. Her childhood was characterized by rejection and emotional absence. I was desperately, constantly looking for approval from my parents, you know, someone to go, God, Carol, you're doing really, really well. And my dad didn't care and my mum was so busy. Okay. Blame and shame were evident in her experience of her child with ASD. Why can't you just be normal? This was redirected through connecting with her child's fear and seeing herself as a child's protector and defender against a hostile world. So for example, she talked of the school wanting to rip her from her child like a plaster. Notice the emotive power of those images. So what there was a relationship based on high anger and fear rather than connected, connecting through shared intimacy and pleasure. So it's gone backwards, my apologies. So there was a sense of Carol and her daughter against the world. I feel like I'm losing my sense of self because I've been enveloped in the fight because that's what it feels like. I feel like it's me and her against the world, you know? I feel like we're one sometimes. But you know, sometimes it feels empowering that I can, I'm fighting a cause. But other times I feel like, you know, I'm trying to hold on to that, that, that it will get better, you know, that we'll win the fight. It's just completely consuming. And I feel like I can't get away, I can't escape. So you can see that the fight helps Carol maintain this sense of being good, a good mother and that sense of oneness, we're like one. But the cost is that she's embroiled in a fight and that, that she's exhausted, that it's emotionally um, consuming. So you can see the ambiguity there. The fight is both empowering, she uses the word, but it's also consuming and exhausting and she feels trapped. And again, even the more positive um, passages she values the time. We, we snuggle up together, you know, it's beginning to be near me, close to me. You know, just feeling like I think she spends so much of her life not understood and it feels the world feels like such a scary place to her. But when one of the, it's one of the few times she relaxes and you can see she just kind of melts and we might just snuggle up on the sofa. But it's one of the few times when she's clearly relaxed because she feels safe and understood. Now, there's an ambiguity here because there's some positive images of connection, but fear, and that's partly why I've used the red um, highlighter, fear is undergirding these images. Scary place, melts, suggests that other times she's like at ice, one of the few times she relaxes. And then the need to emphasize how she feels safe rather than just safety coming out of the images themselves. And again, there's a sense of exhaustion and desperation. I'm very aware potentially how I am around Ella will influence how she's feeling. So I'm just trying to maintain those high energy levels, you know, oh, morning, you know, school today, you're doing fantastic. Here's your uniform. And she's screaming at me and I'm going to be, it's going to be wonderful. You're going to have a great day. And, you know, just trying to maintain that kind of positivity about her for everything, it's exhausting doing that on a daily basis, you know, and trying to show her how to model that life can be good. Now, okay, my delivery is exaggerating perhaps, but there's a sense of, it kind of made me think of Faulty Towers almost. There's a sense of um, desperation about this. So she's trying to model how things can be positive, but you can see in the words, the screaming, the, the high arousal in mum, that a child will pick up that there's, that there's fear and anxiety and even anger behind behind this desperately imposed normality. Okay, 
Now I'm, um, okay, I'll follow this example and then bring things to a close. For Dave being a parent meant not containing, meant containing his anger in a way his own father couldn't. I couldn't control it. Just feeling like I should be controlling this. I should be a parent, you know, that sort of stuff, putting myself under pressure, but it is what it is really. I was in B&Q today and a lady had a young lad playing up around the stuff, around the shop and stuff, whizzing around on the wheelie thing. And I thought he's just got autism. Here, Dave's corrective intentions are being undermined by his sense of shame triggered by his child. Dave's mother was a part of a strict and socially isolated religious group, placed him in situations where he felt humiliated. He wanted a different future for him and his children. My mother was a constant embarrassment, to be honest. One day I'm going to be free of this woman. I can start living. So caught between this, these different intentions, he can't find a way of seeing himself as an effective parent. He feels trapped by his child exactly as he did by his mother. You just feel hemmed in like you're on a ship, a prison ship, trapped with them and you can't get away. So what I guess is coming out of this is the lack of agency with parents caught between their own intentions to do something better and their actual experience of parenting their child. And also the way in which autism itself essentializes and mechanizes the problems um, of the child. This is a point I think I could go on and maybe I will in terms of questions, but essentially um, notice the way in which in the very language of talking about him locked inside his own head sees the child as essentially separate and unreachable. And as I mentioned before, this raises a key question for attachment. How can attachment function if a parent feels unable to offer protection and nurture for their child? So the language of autism itself drives parents towards a very, taking a very separate stance towards their child. Okay. I think I, what I wanted to emphasize was this is a common problem among the parents. So I'm, what I'm trying to say, I think, is that parents pay a price for the autism diagnosis. It resolves, it releases them of blame, or at least apparently does, but at the same time, it, it, it intensifies their sense of otherness from their child, making it harder to, um, to experience the connection that drives the caregiving system. So what can we learn from all of this? Well, attending to how the parent gives meaning helps understand the pain experienced by the family. Looking at trauma, um, and looking at the effects of that on relationships, not to say that it's causing the child's autism, but to see how it's shaped. The role of shame, the, um, the way in which autism speak itself may be entrenching problems and reinforcing the lack of agency. And also I think helping parents look at the ways in which the, their child is like them to see whether that sense of connection to the child could be restored. OK, I've had to rush the ending a bit um, just to say essentially that um, this, of course, is a simplified analysis simply of the parents. We need to kind of open it up to other data, to the child, to the family system. And we also need to recognise that this isn't supposed to, um, like all research of this nature, I'm not speaking for the experience of all parents. The context is key and each story is different. Rather, it's a way of highlighting problems and, and issues um, that may be ignored by the current literature. Finally, simply to acknowledge, as I started with my own stance, I am, if you like, the 17th case. And this attempt to marry um, often to opposing extent, the relational one and, and, the, and also the personal one certainly drives the research. Now, I'm simply going to show for the slide um, for those who can watch the recording <clears throat>